record, 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 and no one reminds me. I forget and you forget too. Okay, it's recording now. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just beginning to record now providentially. I'm just beginning to get into the lecture on energy and speaking about, we're going to look at the production and consumption of energy in the United States and a little bit at the level of the world, how we compare with the rest of the world. And so with regards to energy sources, we can say that there are two main types of energy sources those that are non-renewable and those that are renewable, okay? So uh, the first half of the uh, lecture will be focusing on these uh, types of energies. So let's look at the non-renewable source of, it, of energy first. The big one is fossil fuels, of course. Fossil fuels, which involve uh, essentially that uh, fossil fuel in three states, a solid, liquid or gas, all right? So we have coal, and the solid state is coal, petroleum, which is a very thick and complex uh, liquid, and then uh, gas, natural gas of different types. So that's one source of non-renewable energy, which is still the main source for most of the world for the energy uh, production throughout the world. And then nuclear energy, which of course is highly sophisticated and uh, <clears throat> but it, it renders a tremendous amount of energy so that a nuclear reactor can truly uh, give energy to an entire city or a region of, of uh, the world, right? So it has uh, great potential, but there are uh, dangers with it too. With regards to renewable energy sources, renewable, uh, so non-renewable means that once that energy is used up and spent, that source is not renewed, right? Whereas renewable is that it's essentially, there is uh, somewhat of an unlimited supply of it uh, in the various forms. For example, solar energy, solar is definitely renewable in the sense that we have a constant source of sunlight hitting the earth at some part of the earth uh, every day. Wind energy also, the wind is always around. Uh, hydroelectric, as long as uh, rivers are uh, uh, moving uh, downstream, uh, then that is a renewable source of energy. Mm -hmm. Geothermal also, which taps into the, the uh, heat of the earth itself that is being produced from the core outward uh, toward the crust. Wood my, biomass also because that biomass is uh, renewable in principle uh, from forest and other uh, wood chip uh, products. And finally, biofuels, biofuels, which uh, is mostly a product of agriculture. Okay, so we're gonna be looking at each one of these uh, just a little bit. Uh, and this is kind of an overview, all right? It's mostly qualitative. Uh, I have a few, some, some quantities for you to look at, some percentages, uh, things like that, but it's mostly on the qualitative side to give you an overview of the main energy sources in production and consumption in the United States, and then we'll do some comparisons uh, throughout the world. So let's look at uh, non-renewable uh, energy sources. The first one and the biggest one, of course, is fossil fuels. And here are just some examples of uh, coal mining, for example. If it's going to be coal mining, it can either be above the ground or below the ground, all right? Uh, above the ground is known as mountaintop mining or strip mining also. As you can see, uh, first a, a mountain is identified with coal segments in it, with uh, coal streams that they're called, and so that mountain is stripped little by little of the coal. And you can see that this mountain here is extremely rich in coal that is hauled out by uh, uh, earth movers into a factory that will then process that coal. And I wanna point out right away, when you see these smokestacks, at least in the United States with all the smoke coming out, please do not think that this is CO2 that is being released into the atmosphere or methane or other uh, toxic gases, okay? This is essentially water vapor that is being produced because in today's standards in the United States, even though fossil fuels are a major part 
of energy production in the United States because of environmental regulation precisely and what is known as the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, this industry has all kinds of regulations and filters that they have to put, as I'll show you in a diagram in a minute, uh, in order to uh, release these gases to the atmosphere. So at least in the United States, whenever you see uh, smokestacks like this, this is typically water vapor that is being released to the atmosphere because of the excess heat that is being produced in this, uh, in this uh, factories. Okay, so then there's, uh, for coal, there is a strip mining above ground, which has its own issues and concerns because it's, it is extremely damaging to the environment and uh, <clears throat> it's uh, highly restricted. Uh, and then there is underground mining uh, that is done also, uh, ironically, for people, at least for the personnel that are working on the mines, is safer for the personnel, and one can intuit this, it's safer to do above ground mining than to do underground mining, because sometimes these mines can go quite deep, and there are all kinds of issues of pressure and toxic gases and so forth. So at least on the personnel side, on the worker side, above ground mining is much safer than underground mining. Uh, all right, then there are uh, for petroleum, of course, these are oil rigs uh, on land, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, these are oil rigs on the ocean. So it can be, uh, the, the petroleum can also be mm, uh, sought uh, at the bottom of the ocean with these huge oil rigs. And you can see that this one is, this, uh, Bloom here is for burning toxic gases, typically methane and other gases that come out with the petroleum, and they have it at quite a distance from the rigging itself. But this one is burning toxic gases here that are coming out uh, from the from the uh, petroleum uh, well. And this is an actual refinery, an oil refinery, a petroleum refinery, which is again is a very complex process, and many products come out of petroleum. I'll show you a pie chart in a few minutes of all the different products that come out of petroleum today. Mm -hmm. So these are just some examples of uh, fossil fuel uh, use. Mm -hmm. The main issue uh, uh, for coal and for many of these uh, fossil fuel sources is to generate electricity, all right, to generate electricity. How is that done? It is done essentially by burning because the fossil fuel is combustible, right? So that's a, a major quality there. It's uh, organic material that has been turned into a slush over uh, millions of years. And so it is uh, combustible. And so that's what happens. The coal or the petroleum is burned so that water is heated up into steam. All right, here's a source of water. And that's why typically these plants are near a river or a lake or some source of natural water, because that water is heated up, as you can see here in the furnace, all right? And then uh, steam is generated when the water boils. The steam now is under pressure, high pressure. And that is the, the, the uh, kernel, if you will, of energy transfer. The energy transfer is from the fossil fuel, whether it be coal, petroleum or gas, all right, the transfer of energy is through the heat to turn that liquid water into steam. Now steam is under high pressure, all right, and that steam is channeled into turbines or turbines, how do you say in English, turbine or turbine? Turbine? Turbine. Yeah. Turbine, all right. And so the turbines are, are turned, right? The turbines are rotated by the steam. Hmm? Uh, under pressure. And so when the turbines rotate, then mm, there are generators that are associated with those turbines and the generators generate electricity precisely. So that is a transfer of energy here. If you want to think of it in, in physical terms, it's a transfer of energy from uh, organic uh, energy or chemical energy that is in the carbon bonds itself, all right, whether it's solid, liquid or gas, in other words, coal, petroleum, or natural gas. It's chemical energy, it's potential energy available for work. 
that energy is transferred into heat that boils the water. And now that energy is trapped into the pressure of the heat, the high pressure of the heat of the steam that makes, of the steam, sorry, that makes the turbines turn. All right, so here's the transfer from potential to kinetic energy. In other words, the energy in motion is kinetic energy, right? That is turning these generators. And when gener the generators turn precisely, what do they generate? They generate electricity, all right? They generate electricity, which then is farmed out to different uh, substations and so forth, uh, so forth through transformers to light up a city, an industry, a, a business, a commercial, industrial, whatever, all right? So basically, in the big picture, we have a transfer of energy from chemical energy to electrical energy through heat, through steam, through high pressure, okay? And that is a standard. So I, I'm making a, an emphasis on this simply because this is all a product of the industrial revolution. In other words, the refinement of the steam engine. These are variants of the steam engine, which goes back 200 years now, 250 years, more or less, the Industrial Revolution started, uh, um, is, um, uh, let's say, in Great Britain, uh, in the middle of the uh, uh, 1700s, all right, the 18th century, and it spilled over into continental Europe and uh, America and the United States, uh, at the beginning of the 1800s with the Industrial Revolution the, uh, and the shift from a cottage industry where everything was essentially made by hand mm, to mass production of the factory, right? And that was a major shift, probably the most significant shift in labor that has impacted humanity and in general overall impacted the well-being of people at large, okay, for uh, earning better, better jobs, earning better, and that shift from everything handcrafted, which took a long time and large amounts of people, uh, to uh, the machine producing the whatever product it is, and people basically monitoring uh, those machines. That had it all its own set of issues to the point that that machinery became so efficient that that factory production that it tended to enslave the people, <laughs> enslave the worker into uh, the workforce into uh, the factory. And so labor unions had to be established and the church was very instrumental at the beginning in establishing labor unions to protect the rights of laborers, all right? But it really, it was a quantum shift from what is known as a cottage industry up until the uh, 1800s, the, 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 the second half of the 1700s into the 1800s, into what we know today, a uh, contemporary world, industrialized uh, world of essentially working for a factory or a company or an industry. And all that was essentially the steam engine, harnessing steam to do work uh, in, in machines that can do much bigger, faster work that uh, human beings can do. All right, so uh, moving forward, another uh, type of uh, <clears throat> energy source, uh, fossil fuel, that is also controversial, keep in mind the bioethics of all this, is uh, fracking, all right? Uh, fracking, which is uh, shorthand for hydraulic fracturing. So let's look a little bit at uh, fracking. I'm sure you've heard it in the news. It's a little less now, but uh, a few years back, it was a lot in the news, uh, fracking, all right? So, Fracking stands for hydraulic frac fracturing. And part of the controversy is that it creates uh, shock waves under the earth that could affect and actually cause uh, tremors, possibly on, uh, on land, on the towns that uh, are um, on top of uh, wherever the fracking is occurring. So let's look at it in some uh, degree of detail a little bit. First of all, the idea is this that there is um, petroleum, but especially gas, that is trapped in fractures deep into the rock, the rock layer, uh, mostly known as shale. Shale rock, which are sheets of sedimentary rock that have trapped, it's porous, and they have trapped in these crevices 
they have uh, trapped in gas and petroleum, all right? But it's not in a quantity that is large enough to be extracted by a standard oil rig. It's not sufficient. And therefore, it has to be kind of shaken out of the rock, out of the porous rock, all right? So that's, in the big picture, uh, the, the, um, the idea. So uh, what is done is that piping is introduced down two to three kilometers down into the crust of the earth through the topsoil, through the various layers of uh, soil and, uh, and sediment, even through aquifers that uh, tend to be fairly shallow, all right? Uh, where water, natural water gets trapped. Remember when we looked at the hydro uh, cycle, the water cycle, all the way down into the shale layer, which could be anywhere two to three kilometers. We're talking one to two miles down deep, all right? So piping is uh, put down there. And then uh, once it goes vertically, then it goes horizontally, perhaps another one or two miles also horizontally, okay? And this horizontal pipe is a little different because the horizontal pipe is porous or, or has, uh, has holes in it. And then what happens is a brine is pumped down into this area under pressure, a brine of a salty water mixed with sand. And that brine, that mixture is pumped into these cracks, into these features, fissures that open up and expand the cracks, especially with the sand and the salty water helps to uh, mix in with whatever petroleum is there, but especially with the gas. And what happens is that the gas now is it has a way to come out through the pipe, all right? So it's a way of rescuing mostly, mostly natural gas. And, uh, but this is done with explosives and under high pressure, so it tends to create some shock waves through the rock layers. And if it's not, if those shock waves are not absorbed in these uh, upper layers, it may transmit all the way to the top and, and cause some tremors. Mm, there was some concern that, uh, about that in the Midwest, but the, the data is still controversial whether it was actually the fracking that was doing it or not. At any rate, it's, uh, it's an innovative technique. It is controversial. The evidence is, um, uh, depending on who you read and how this land, because uh, some of these uh, depends on who, who writes the article, how they're going to slant it. Uh, there is some concern of contamination of the brine especially through the aquifer, all right? And if there's a breakage on the piping, it could contaminate the aquifer. But the idea is to extract natural gas uh, from the shale layer of rock that is deep into the core of, into the uh, crust of the earth. Uh, uh, I've heard that a few years ago, the United States actually discovered some vast sources of natural gas and coal, but especially natural gas on, on our land, on our soil. And so you can see that that is a huge incentive for uh, economic growth and staying on fossil fuels. And that's one of the reasons why politically, the United States uh, was, um, uh, had issues with the uh, Paris uh, Accord to, to um, try to reduce the, the greenhouse gases uh, to within uh, two degrees uh, centigrade of, of uh, temperature increase uh, because there is a huge economic investment uh, invested here, all right, in natural gas and coal and petroleum in the United States. And that's why it's, uh, when there is economics, then there's gonna be politics involved too. Mm -hmm. Luis? Yeah, I read somewhere about that. Brazil, mm -hmm. um, is totally dependent on that. Is it really? Yes, mm. and that they have somehow um, eliminated a lot of concerns. Yes. Uh, yes, in, uh, I think it's in conjunction working with Shell. Uh -huh. you know, okay, right. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, some of it is, um, is going to be built up over that technology, will be built up over in the United States. Yes. And we mm. will, one of those big Western states mm. is with a tremendous field right. of um, energy that we found on the ground. Right. But one of the only ways to get to it is to crack 
is a fracking. Yes. Yes. So, so it is controversial. I think that, well, a lot has to do on technology, right? And uh, as technology gets better, typically uh, the product is cleaner and so forth. At any rate, the, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, has its regulations for the, the emission of gases, all right? And it's regulating that. But there is heavy, heavy economic interest involved in this uh, for sure. So we have to balance that out with uh, the environmental factors. Mm, even at the end of the day, in the United States, when we look at overall uh, fossil fuel use, we are one of the countries that has the most stringent regulations with regards to pumping uh, um, um, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere with regards to filters and so forth. And in other countries, uh, frankly, either these regulations, either they don't exist, or if they do exist on the books, they're just not enforced because of the massive corruption that goes on. And the typical one, of course, is China, which is one of the main offenders of um, greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, simply because of its, uh, I mean, it has about one quarter of the world's population, so it is incredibly thirsty for energy, and it's still the cheapest source of energy is going to be fossil fuels, okay, especially for countries that have vast territories like China. And Brazil also has uh, huge territories, the largest one in, in South America, of course. Okay, uh, I think, is it petrogas or, uh, what's it called? No, uh, petrobras, petrobras, I think is the name of the Brazilian uh, yeah. petroleum company. Yeah. It's petrobras, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, just to look a little bit at how petroleum is being used in the United States mm, with this uh, pie chart, uh, uh, almost half of it is for gasoline, right? For gasoline, for cars and, and other vehicles, uh, buses, uh, uh, everything that uses gasoline, motors, piston motors. Then uh, another quarter, so that's about half more or less, and another quarter is uh, for diesel. So three fourths of petroleum refinement, uh, refinery in the United States is uh, for, um, for motor fuel, for moving for transportation. Another 10% almost, 9%, almost 10%, all right, is uh, jet fuel. So that is still transportation. Now we're talking about air transportation and imagine uh, this one, in my mind, this one is highly efficient in the sense that uh, it's only 10% of the whole pie, and yet imagine everything that moves through the air today, you know, in air transportation, not only with regards to, uh, to people, right, passengers, but also cargo, which is huge, all right? And uh, so uh, in my mind, I don't know, just intuitively for the bang for the buck, I think that this is one of the most uh, efficient ones because it moves vast amount of people and cargo with only about 10% of the petroleum uh, refinement. At any rate, when we add these three, all right, we're at about 85% of the pie for transportation one way or another, either on land or on air, and including the sea because so many of the uh, ships also use uh, diesel fuel. So the other 15%, think is in there, the other 15% is mostly lubricants and oils and also asphalt. But all these, you know, are really recyclable one way or another. Even the car oil has to be recycled, right? That's why we're not supposed to dump the car oil in the garbage or anything that goes into some uh, recovery company that does something with that oil. So whereas the 85% of fuels that's not recoverable because it's burnt up, actually it's combustion. The others, the other 15% is somehow recoverable in the sense that it's not being burnt, all right? It's not combustion, but it's used mostly for lubricant or asphalt, which eventually that road is ground up and, and uh, recycled somehow. Uh, and then the last 10% uh, here is typically the plastic products, all right? The plastic products, which we have a challenge uh, for recycling, uh, recycling that. So I talked about that extensively last time. Okay, so this gives a picture that uh, at least in the US, uh, the petroleum refinement that is going on 
is mostly used 85% for fuel for combustion, which that is the non-renewable part right there, okay? But it's moving the industry, it's moving commerce, it's moving transportation, land, sea, and air. And then the other 15%, which could be recyclable somehow uh, with, you know, maybe there's a small margin of efficiency, but at least it can be recyclable. Uh, moving to nuclear then, nuclear of course is sophisticated in the sense that uh, we're talking about nuclear power, all right? But I also wanna point out, hmm? yes, <laughs> it's a sigmoid curve, exactly, <laughs> from statistics. You're, you're beginning to have nightmares about statistics, right? <laughs> there is a sigmoid curve, yes, indeed. It's interesting how it follows that uh, typical uh, growth pattern, okay? for something that is totally artificial, because this is certainly an artifact, right? Uh, and why would it follow a natural growth curve? But it does. At any rate, I wanna point out that uh, most generators today are in the third generation, okay? The nuclear power uh, plants today are what is known as third generation, some second generation. The first generation um, um, Plants are shut down. Uh, they really weren't that efficient and more risk. In fact, I think that uh, Chernobyl was a first generation and I think Three Mile Island was also a first generation uh, reactor. Those were the, so there have been uh, uh, three major uh, nuclear power accidents in the world uh, to our knowledge, all right? Three Mile Island, which was in the 70s, I think 77 or something like that here in the United States, a, uh, a nuclear power accident. And then the big one, Chernobyl, uh, uh, around 84, 85, 1984. And that was so big that it actually slowed down the production of uh, nuclear reactors throughout the world because it became very unpopular, uh, mostly by, by the common folk. But what happened in the meantime is that the generators kept progressing at the level of nuclear physics, all right? And now we're into what is known as the fourth generation uh, generators uh, or plants. And this fourth generation plants have, uh, they're much more efficient, they're much more safe, all right? Uh, practically everything is recoverable and you don't even have the, again, this is water vapor coming out from these uh, cooling towers, all right? This is not uh, nuclear waste coming out through, through the nuclear uh, plant here. This is just basically water vapor because the basic principle is the same, is to harness that nuclear power into heat that boils water, and then guess what? That steam is going to move electrical generators to generate electricity. So really at the core, even of nuclear power plants, is the old steam engine <laughs> of almost 300 years ago, okay? At the very core, a very sophisticated way to do it, but nonetheless, it's the same basic old thing of moving a generator to generate electricity, okay? You can wait. Uh, a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Wasn't there an issue in the early, uh, with the early um, nuclear power plants? what to do with the residue? Yes, exactly. So uh, what is known as, yes, what is known as the spent rods, the spent rods. In other words, the, the uh, nuclear rods, the, 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 uh, the um, uh, radioactive rods, yeah. all right, that are used up, yeah. they still have radioactivity in them and their, their half-life is uh, sometimes in the hundreds or thousands of years to decay, all right, what to do with the spent rods, right. And uh, recently, in fact, uh, a couple of years ago, we had a, a conference here at St. Thomas uh, uh, on climate, nature, and society. And it was a two-day conference dedicated to the complex issues of, um, of um, bioethics in the environment, uh, be, uh, precisely motivated by the publication of Laudato Si. And one of the speakers, one of the six speakers that we had was a nuclear physicist, uh, Dr. Muller, from, um, he's, at, um, he's at Stanford in, in California. He's one of the speakers. And he said that uh, there's a project now to take those spent rods 
and put them down, you know where? Precisely into the old fracking holes down three kilometers deep and across horizontally to bury them down there where that nuclear reactivity has no way to reach the surface because it has to go through so many layers of rock that, I mean, there's more radioactivity on the surface. If you go out with a Geiger counter to uh, the Midwest and just start reading uh, uh, isotopes from the ground, from the soil, you get more of a reading than you would if you bury these nuclear rods down into the fracking holes, all right, that are old and, and are, are used up already. So that's a very innovative idea. And in fact, it was, it was interesting. I was part of that conversation. He was sharing that with Cardinal Turkson, who was the, the man who drafted Daulato Si for Pope Francis, because um, Laudato Si, which you may know is the papal encyclical, the first papal encyclical in the history of the Catholic Church dedicated to the environment, 2015, all right, is very critical. It mentions nuclear um, reactors, uh, nuclear energy several times, about four or five times, but generally in the negative. It does say it's not favorable. And yet the nuclear physicists are telling us that the transition as we get off fossil fuels into renewable energy, the transition could very well be nuclear because we get a huge amount of bang for the buck, okay? In other words, for those nuclear reactors, especially the fourth generation, and they're already in design, in design there's a fifth generation uh, of nuclear reactors uh, for nuclear physicists that is still theoretical, all right? They're still working on the theory, but they're moving forward on this where uh, the, the idea is to essentially reuse and reuse those rods until you basically have nothing left of, of nuclear activity, all right? of uh, radioactivity. Uh, but what I want to say was, finally, we got from Cardinal Turkson that the, the, um, the reticence from the part of the Vatican with regards to nuclear reactors is precisely what to do with the spent rods. You know, what to do because there's also security issues with that and military issues and so forth, all right? They require high security to, to uh, store them. And uh, so, uh, that's when Muller was suggesting to Cardinal Turkson, well, uh, there's a plan now, physicists are studying this, to bury those rocks down into the fracking holes. So there's another advantage of, like a, a collateral advantage, yeah. if you will, from fracking. Interesting, you know, human creativity. Yeah, 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 yeah. Human creativity is fantastic because stuff that we really cannot think about, the physicists are there. You know, they're thinking yeah. about the impossible, <laughs> how to make the impossible possible. Okay, so it was very interesting to be part of that conversation um, and then have the conference itself. By the way, I keep saying I have that conference uh, stored in, in a, um, in a uh, the whole two days, all six talks. Uh, it's in a website, it's in a link. So I'm going to send you the link so you can look at it uh, sometime over the summer and then um, we can pick it up again in the fall. But uh, uh, in my opinion, that was a very historic conference that we had here at St. Thomas the first one that had been done right after Laudato Si. Okay, so you can see here basically the history uh, in the past half century, all right, a little bit uh, uh, in the 1960s is when these reactors started. In fact, I remember uh, my brother, we were just two brothers, and my brother uh, is a year and a half older. When he was, went to college, he came here to the United States. We were both living in, in Latin America at that time. And he wanted to study nuclear physics, okay? He, he's always loved math and, and physics and so forth. And so he wanted to study nuclear physics and he went to the University of, um, the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Stony Brook, uh, the State University system in New York is expansive, it's all over the state. And they have one campus at Stony Brook. And this was 1969, 68, 1968 when he went uh, which would be around here. And the reason why he went to Stony Brook is because that was the only university back then in the United States that had a nuclear reactor for educational purposes. Because all the other nuclear reactors in the United States up until that point were military <laughs> and were, you know, were top secret and, and classified stuff because it was for, it was uh, nuclear reactors, no? For, for enriching uranium. 
So that was the only, the first university in the United States that had a nuclear reactor for educational purposes. You know, it was something modest, but it was real. So uh, anyway, and it was 68, I remember. So right when this curve starts going into, from the lag phase oh, into the log right. phase, all right, <laughs> into the log phase. And for a couple of decades, it kept going strong. Then Three Mile Island happened, but you can see that in Three Mile Island, it didn't have much impact on the active reactors, but it did have an impact on the uh, reactors that were under construction. So this starts tapering off. And then what was really the clincher was uh, Chernobyl, which was a real meltdown. And that, was, of course, was because of breach of all kinds of regulations that they have that they didn't put in place. And of course, it was a totalitarian state and they just literally melted down to the ground. So that took a big hit on um, the construction of nuclear reactors. And then uh, Fukushima in, in Japan, which this one we have to put in context because what happened here actually was a double was a tsunami that hit it. A tsunami, remember, is a hurricane in the Pacific, which typically have twice as much strength as the ones in the Atlantic, right? So they are huge. And then uh, the aftershock of that was also a tremor, they had, a, they had an earthquake. So the combination of those two things, uh, and Fukushima was on the, the nuclear reactor was on the slope precisely next to the ocean. Uh, but even it shut down, it really shut down. The leakage was minimal because even though it received that huge impact, uh, the system did shut down and the leakage was minimal, all right? Mm -hmm. I remember that image mm -hmm. that stuck in my mind yes. from that. You know when they were trying to cool, cool down the cooling rods right. with, with seawater, which mm -hmm. you know is impossible. Yeah. And, and they're opening up the seawater because you know that tsunami so right. was coming. Exactly. They opened up that whole year of when it's seawater and it couldn't do it. Right, right, yeah, because yeah, exactly it gets so hot. That intense heat was. Yes, yes, it is. And, and, and that image is still here. Yes. Yes, yeah, but it's interesting. Um, I don't want to take the time, but you can follow. You you can read on Fukushima. There's some nice articles there, and uh, now we can measure the long term because this was uh, in 2011 or 2012 um, around there. Uh, how over the years, you know, what is the long term or what we can see at least middle term effects of it. Really, it was not that much. It was not that much. Even the people who were actually affected by it was minimal number, all right, compared to the disaster that it could have been. So it was really contained quite a bit. And that's because of the advancement of these uh, generation of uh, nuclear reactors. But anyway, just want to leave it with the fact that there is a lot of promise in nuclear reactor, but again, it's heavily dependent on technology and even behind the technology itself is just the enforcement of the regulations. Of course, it's an expensive proposition for sure. However, I see it as an investment because it's a, a feasible way of getting off fossil fuels and at the same time providing large amounts of energy, especially in the urban areas that are so thirsty for, for our uh, energy lifestyle today, okay? So I don't think that um, we should discard um, uh, nuclear energy. And yet in Europe, it's taking a big impact, uh, particularly in Germany uh, and France also. Yes, uh, I know that Germany, um, Prime Minister Merkel, uh, had so much pressure from the Green parties that uh, she uh, started shutting down all the nuclear reactors in Germany and then divided the country. The north part is going to be uh, driven mostly by uh, uh, wind, I believe, and the southern part by hydroelectric, all right? But uh, they are uh, walking away from uh, nuclear reactors. I think part of it is also their historical background of uh, their um, involvement in Second World War and the potential military danger there. I don't know, it gets very complicated. Uh, let's look at this then overall uh, chart here that gives us since the industrial revolution um, uh, going forward, the amount of uh, energy used, the different sources of energy being used in the United States for the past 150 years or so, all right? Mm. As we can see, 
First, it was coal on the rise, huge. This is all the Industrial Revolution here during the 1800s into the beginning of the 1900s. Then coal uh, tapers off and is being replaced by petroleum, you see, with the advance, excuse me, of uh, nuclear, re uh, I'm sorry, of um, uh, petroleum um, refineries, all right, oil refineries. And so petroleum basically takes over in the 1900s as the main uh, energy source for the United States um, and then is being replaced by natural gas up until uh, this day, all right? And then the other one that is here in blue is uh, nuclear, as you can see, it's in here. It has its ups and downs. We don't know how this, uh, it seems to have some kind of cycle there. And this is also heavily driven by politics, you know, and I think that in a bipartisan system, there is that uh, <clears throat> back and forth effect of the partisan politics that affects because nuclear is uh, very, very controversial uh, with regards to our politics. Mm. But uh, what I want to point out is this little, the, the red dotted line, all right? The red dotted line is a line of demarcation between the non-renewables, which essentially are fossil fuels, and the browns here are fossil fuels, and nuclear, which is also non-renewable, right? To renewable which would be hydroelectric, which is the main one of the renewables, is the main one for the United States, and then others, right? And if we follow this line of demarcation here, right, between non-renewables below, which is the major part of the energy source, and the renewables on the top, and we extrapolate it all the way to the y-axis, it, it comes around 90%, 90%. What does this mean? This means that about, 90% of the energy being used in the United States today or be, being produced in the United States today, either from fossil fuels or from nuclear, is non-renewable, right? Which basically is a heavy dependency of the United States on non-renewable resources of energy, heavy dependency. And only 10% so far is renewable. Typically, what do you think is, um, Part of this is historical, right? Historical. What do you think is the issue here? The renewable, what's your intuition? What requires more sophisticated technology and more creativity? The non-renewable, fossil fuels, or even nuclear, or the renewables? Renewable. Renewables require more creativity and more sophisticated technology, new ways of doing things, new ways of extracting energy from nature, that can be renewed, all right? There's one more deficiency with nuclear energy. Mm. Uh, yes. Security. Right. Because when we build a nuclear plant, right? exactly. And you destroy that, you destroy everything around you. So exactly. So what might be a strength for energy is a weakness for defense. Right. Exactly. So you bring up a, a good point, uh, Dickon Lewis, the security issue, and in the world that we live today with uh, with uh, international terrorism and so forth, but this allows me to mention redundancy, which I hadn't mentioned before, but these plants have uh, layers of redundancy, okay? By that, I mean that uh, they have, uh, uh, several things will shut them down, all right? And they will shut down, once they go into some level of invasiveness, they start shutting down, and shutting down automatically. And then they have layers of redundancy of shutting down. So it could be either a natural phenomenon like either a hurricane or an earthquake that shuts it down automatically, or it can be a man-made uh, phenomenon like a bomb or uh, a threat. And they have these levels of redundancy that they just start shut down automatically and there's no way to restart them because the systems are fail safe and they have typically four or five levels of redundancy to shut down before they actually get to the core, all right? So we can say that substantially, essentially, that the very core is impenetrable, you know? Once, once it's in there, it's practically impossible to get to it because of, of this redundancy that happens, okay? These are levels of security that are happening today. It's happening in cybernetics, all right? Banks do that. 
uh, businesses that have a lot at stake, the cloud, you know, has levels of redundancy for impenetrableness, all right? And there are automated, exactly, they are. Yeah, it's a big industry. So for example, cybersecurity in general, it's a huge industry and it's a huge field uh, to get into. So cybersecurity, it's amazing what is going on behind the scenes uh, that is really, I mean, it is classified, but we have some hint of it because of these layers of redundancy, okay? Yeah. You can think something similar with, a, I mean, if we can maintain a nuclear silo safe, yeah, essentially, from a nuclear so, attack, so, yeah, it's kind of similar, yeah. you know? It's a similar issue. Wow. Okay, interesting. Okay, so we can look at this um, energy consumption in a pie shape again. Hmm? Oh yeah, it's fine. that's why I'm saying this new, that's why bioethics gets into these uh, from the ethical perspective, but it has an actual physical, tangible implementation, which is cybersecurity, you know, for ethical reasons. Why would you have security? Precisely to maintain the good and to avoid evil from breaking in. <laughs> hmm? Okay, so this graph that I had here, all right, in the different sources between renewable and non-renewable, we can put that into a pie shape, basically, which looks like this. So here for the US, here's that, here that 10% of renewables, mm -hmm, the 90% non-renewable, which uh, also produce uh, as the byproduct of that steam engine of the, of the heat produced and the burning, the combustion, of the fossil fuel or the nuclear is uh, producing the carbon dioxide and between carbon dioxide and methane, which is also a greenhouse gas, again, is about 90% of the gases that are produced from that non-renewable sources, okay? So that's the concern here is the emission of these uh, greenhouse gases mm, from the non-renewable sources of the renewable sources, which obviously doesn't produce the greenhouse gases, right? Uh, then, uh, well, I take it back, some will uh, have to make distinctions in here too, uh, especially when there's combustion involved. But anyway, I want to go now into the renewable ones, which are subdivided into uh, several different types. Mm -hmm. uh, hydropower, which is about a quarter of that renewable in the United States. And then biofuels, another 20% more or less. Uh, wood, uh, biomass, another 20%. Wind, another 20%. And then the rest is uh, garbage, burning garbage, actually it's about 5%. Solar, about 5%. And then geothermal, very, very little. So far, only 2%. Uh, again, uh, the technology is, uh, is uh, challenging here. But uh, this, in general, follows more or less the sophistication of technology. The more sophisticated the technology, the, the less we are extracting proportionally of the renewable energy sources. How do we compare with the rest of the world before we uh, move forward into the renewables? Well, we are about 20%, uh, a little over 20% using renewable sources that... Uh, compared to the rest of the world, okay? So if you think that, um, considering this, that we, uh, there are almost 200 nations in the world, 194, 95, I think, uh, nations in the world, all right? So we can round it up to about 200 nations. We are one of those 200 nations. And we are producing uh, about 20% of the renewable, energy in the world, this one country is doing about 20% of that. <laughs> so that's pretty significant. You know, when we are attacked for being contaminators and so forth, yes, we are contaminating with the, with the um, uh, greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane, because our industry is still heavily dependent on fossil fuels. It's still the cheapest way to move those engines, all right, to move those factories. But still, even so, in spite of that, we are still producing about 20% of the renewable energy of the world, this one country. So, you know, that's significant, <laughs> very significant. We should be producing one two hundredth percentage, <laughs> you know, which is what, what 200, uh, one of 200 is 5%, that's 5%. Yeah. 
Okay, so we are doing four times our share. Five times. Five times. Five times. Five times. Okay, almost five times. Okay, so we put it in perspective when we hear all the arguments for and con, when, they, when this gets into politics and to ideology, they don't look at these pie charts, okay? They look at ideology, and so that's why for us, the facts count. This is evidence-based bioethics. But the highest mm -hmm. one on the scale is hydrophobic. I'm sorry? Hydrophobic is the highest one on our scale. Yes, yes, yes it is. Mm -hmm. It is, about a, a quarter. There's always been a muscle when you have to be like that. Yes, because of environmental impact. Again, controversial. Well, let's look at it because now what I'm going to do is going to go into these uh, one by one, just uh, briefly. So now, let me see, it's uh, 10.30. Should we break now or continue? Because now we have another little bit to go. Um, yeah, I'm thinking, why don't we take a break now? It's a good time to take a, a break. And then we're going to go into the renewables one by one. All right. And then finally, um, the human factor, the natural right to have uh, access to energy. And just conclude with the papal statement. Last week, a Holy Father who convened uh, CEOs of major oil companies at the Vatican for a two day conference. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. So he's really moving forward on, on the Latin. Okay, so let's uh, take a break here for a moment. And we'll come back and look at the renewable energies uh, only about 10 minutes, okay? So I'll be back at uh, 1040. Every pope has come into a situation with Okay, so uh, welcome back. And uh, we're going forward. I want to point out a couple of things um, <clears throat> that came up uh, during the break. First of all, the fall semester, we start, uh, it starts on August 27, the week of August 27, all right, is the fall semester, which will be the last semester for this program, for uh, you all, for this cohort. And again, you need to register for two courses there. It is the healthcare bioethics and also the internship. All right, so you will register for those two courses. I'll send you a link with the information where you can uh, sign in for the um, register for the last two courses uh, of the program, which will be in the fall. But of those two courses, remember the one that will be here on the ground or through, uh, through Zoom uh, virtually will be the healthcare bioethics, which is being taught by a number of medical doctors who will come in and, and give talks. Uh, and the other one is the internship, which you should be doing already because it's a total 150 hours and you don't want to that, that accumulate in the last semester, okay? So remember, I'm, I'm requesting that you finish that internship uh, at most by the end of November so that you don't leave it hanging there the last two weeks of December. Uh, so please continue to work on your internship and document it. Uh, I will send again on um, this email today. I will send you the worksheet that you should be where you should be posting the number of hours and the day that you uh, worked those hours, that you volunteered those hours in the internship, so that it comes to a total of 150. And the form for the mentor, for the uh, mentor. I only need one of the mentors, okay? If you have several mentors, at least one of them to sign that internship uh, form. And so they don't have to be concerned about the number of hours. They just have to be concerned about the quality of your internship with them. So I'll send that form, uh, the mentor form also with uh, today's email. Mm. And the other thing that I had, oh yes, the evaluations while we are on this uh, uh, formats and things, the evaluation for this course for the environmental bioethics, uh, our, our secretary, our admin should have sent you by email, right? A form, an evaluation form. Thank you very much. Uh, Deacon Louis and uh, Father Pierre have done their evaluations already. So the rest of you, please, if you have not done it yet, very important. I look at those to I take it seriously to better the course from year to year, all right? So please respond to that evaluation. I'm looking for 100% participation now since uh, the last uh, courses, uh, it was uh, a week, unfortunately, 
part of it was my fault because we didn't know if it was going to be done on, on the ground or online and it was a mess. So now we just decided to email the form and then you send it back, okay? So please uh, do that evaluation, fill it in and send it back directly to Estella, which will be confidential. I will not see the, the names, but I will see uh, whatever feedback you give me uh, on that evaluation. All right, any questions or comments about that? No? Let's go back to energy. Okay, so we left here, and now what I want to do is get into the fun stuff, the renewable, right, which overall is only 10% of the energy sources in the United States today, but, you know, it's 10% more than it was um, 50 years ago, <laughs> because 50 years ago, basically, well, maybe we had hydroelectric, and that's about it. So now it's an increasing number of renewable sources, and not only in, in variety of um, uh, sources, but also uh, the impact, the percentage that they can have of renewable, all right? So this is the promising area looking forward into the present and the future. Beginning with hydroelectric then, these are dams typically on rivers that have a large flow. Uh, I heard one time that practically every river in the United States is dammed at some point or another, okay? Practically every river in the United States has been dammed. Not all of them have hydroelectric uh, plants attached to them, but many are dammed simply to conserve the water and to manage the water flow one way or another for irrigation, typically agriculture, or even for urban areas. So practically every major river of the United States has been dammed uh, for uh, the benefit of the people who live uh, in that area. So here is what happens with a hydroelectric uh, plant, uh, essentially a generator. It, the water is channeled through a turbine and the turbine then is turned, and makes the generator generate electricity, which is pumped into the transformer and from the transformer out to uh, the city, whatever is gonna use it, or commercial industry, et cetera. So basically, what this water flow, the downward water flow is replaces the steam engine. You can see it replaces the steam under high pressure, but the end result is the same. In other words, turning a turbine to generate electricity, and then that electricity is, uh, <clears throat> Uh, channeled uh, through transformers into our commercial use. All right, so here the energy source we can say is potential energy in gravity is what's driving the flow of this water is potential energy in gravity and as that potential energy transforms into kinetic energy of moving the turbine then that generates the electricity itself. So it's a transfer of energy from uh, potential energy of gravity to kinetic energy of uh, electricity. Now, it is controversial, and Dikunlu, you mentioned, yes, uh, dams uh, are sometimes uh, controversial in the sense that they will uh, restrict the flow of the river downstream, and they will increase the volume of water upstream from the dam to the point of taking in land, uh, the, the neighboring land will be flooded, right? And typically, uh, this is done in areas where there is uh, sometimes uh, towns or, or settlements have to be uh, relocated. But the overall good that this provides for agriculture, for having a fresh water source to the people living around it, and even recreation, because then once a river is done like this, essentially you get a lake up here upstream, which then even has recreation power. So typically, you have a lot of uh, state and sometimes even national parks that grow around these uh, these uh, dammed um, uh, lakes. Okay. Provide for fishing as well. Fishing, of course. Yeah, because they get they get concentrated in that area. Yes, yes, for sure. And also speaking of fishing, now again with environmental regulations and keeping in mind that many of these rivers are a source whoops, for uh, freshwater fish going upstream to spawn and all that. Uh, typically trout and salmon, right? But other fish as well. And typically what they do on the side of the dam is they create uh, like a stairway fall, right? 
a stairway fall where the fish can jump upstream back up into the, the lake and then continue upstream into the streams and rivulets that fed that, that feed into the tributaries, what are known as the tributaries of, of the river, of the major river, so that the fish can go and spawn there. It's well documented that trout, uh, but especially salmon, and that tend to mature down into the ocean, go back to the uh, stream where they hatched, uh, way upstream, you know, sometimes thousands of miles away from uh, the ocean where they, uh, where they live. And so that needs to be provided. Okay, uh, moving forward then, and, and that is about a quarter of the renewable energy in the United States is uh, all these uh, river uh, dams, hydroelectric. Another one, which is very big now, is a biofuel. Biofuel is about 20%, uh, 22% is uh, from mostly corn, but uh, other um, grains can do it also. It's simply because we have, remember that we, that overall we're producing four times as much food as needed for the world population. So there's an excess production now. We've gotten so efficient with uh, contemporary, with uh, tertiary or quaternary agriculture that uh, there's a vast excess uh, production of, um, of grain. Uh, especially in the Midwest, right? The, what is known as the breadbasket of the US. Um, so that grain is uh, grounded into a mush and then that mush is put into a fermentation uh, still, essentially a still, and then the, the fermented uh, liquid, right, is distilled into uh, different alcohols, ethanol, right? So it's a still, it's basically, a, this is the industrial equivalent of moonshine. <laughs> yes. right. And so we have gone from the age of prohibition a century ago to the age of exuberant amount of alcohol being produced or uh, yeah, different alcohols from fermentation of grain, all right? The fermentation of uh, essentially starch, which is a carbohydrate, it's a complex uh, carbohydrate molecule. So we can see again, the transfer here is chemical energy that is basically purified because when we think about it, there's no burning here. So that's the advantage that the, in, in this particular case, just like in hydroelectric, there's no production, there's no combustion, and therefore there's no production of greenhouses. So this is very green, green greenhouse gases, all right? Hydroelectric, totally clean. Uh, this one, biofuels also. Uh, but of course, the ethanol eventually will be burned. That's the challenge there, okay? But it's a cleaner burn than petroleum, than gasoline. At any rate, uh, you have gasoline now that has up to five, 10% ethanol in it, and that's the biofuel, which is renewable, again, through agriculture. One challenge here is that I hear that these fields, these uh, farmers now that are doing mass production of grain, as you can see here, these combines, all right, uh, they pick the, the, the corn on one end and on the other end of the machine comes out the, the corn grain into this uh, loaders, which is then taken for the grinding and milling and the grinding. Uh, I hear that these farmers now that have vast acreage in the Midwest are getting more money for the grain for biofuel than they are for feed, all right? So what happens in a market economy, that's driving the feed market to a higher price, you know, more expensive. And of course, that tends to get passed on from the cattle industry to the consumer. So the ribeye costs more money today <laughs> because the feed is more expensive because these farmers are getting more money for their grain uh, for biofuel, all right? Simply pointing the great thirst uh, that we have uh, as a nation for energy. Mm -hmm. Everything, all of the technology is run on energy. Okay, but that amounts to about 20%, which was not around a few decades ago. A big jump there. Uh, the next one, which is also renewable, is uh, wood biomass essentially wood chips, wood chips, in other words, ground up wood 
And this could be wood from forest, but also the wood, remember one of the byproducts of, uh, <coughs> of uh, waste, of human um, garbage. In other words, you know, construction material here, we're used to construction being mostly cinder block or concrete block because of the stringent uh, code, construction code of hurricanes. But outside of Florida, most of construction, at least residential construction, is wood. All right, it's wood or wood chip or, or a wood paste. And so that can be recyclable and it's done through this uh, process of burning the wood, burning the wood and heating up the water into steam, which will then drive that turbine as we've seen before in, in other uh, systems, driving the turbine to generate electricity. So again, the steam engine comes back for generating electricity. And just like with, bio, with uh, petroleum, the transfer of energy here is from chemical energy in the cellulose of the wood to electrical energy uh, through uh, steam, electrical energy uh, of the generator, okay? Also a byproduct of this is ash, which can then be used in landfill, but this tends to acidify the soil and can be a concern for contamination. Uh, but this is uh, amounting to about 20%, 21% of the renewable energy of the United States, uh, energy source, either from forests that are secondary growth, that are ground up into chips, or wood byproduct, uh, garbage essentially from construction and other materials of human uh, uh, production. Uh, moving forward into cleaner stuff, we have wind, uh, which again around 20%, 19% right now of energy sources in the United States of the renewables, all right? This is 20%, 19% of the 10%. <laughs> uh, the two main types of turbines are these uh, three spoke turbines, which are huge. Keep in mind the scale here. Look at these cars and trucks on the highway. Uh, so these are huge structures, even though when we see them at the distance, they look like just little uh, turbines, but they, they are really uh, huge in size. And they don't have to go very fast either to generate a lot of electricity in the turbine here, uh, which is then pumped into the grid. This is an alternative um, design of these uh, spokes. Uh, these uh, these uh, blades, if you will, that also turn. But again, the scale here is huge. Okay, this would be like a little house. You see here, down here, this is like a maintenance house. You see the little house here, just to get a size of the scale. These are also huge structures. In order for them to be profitable, really, they have to be that large. Okay, but there are two basic designs. The most prominent one that you see for some reason is this one. I guess they're just being mass produced now and it's, uh, it's just gotten into the production pipeline uh, uh, faster. Maybe they're easier to install, I really don't know. But that accounts to about 20% more or less of the renewable energy source in the United States. Another one, just burning garbage. Burning garbage, uh, the system works basically like this. There's a dumping site, which is then channeled into a burning chamber. That chamber, of course, has to be contained. That chamber will produce essentially two things. Will produce heat to generate steam. And the steam will again move that uh, steam engine, the turbine to generate electricity. And then there are gases that are produced in that burning process, including some toxic gases that have to be filtered out, of course, uh, EPA. So the first layer of gases is gonna be nitrogen oxide. Second layer, mercury and dioxin are also filtered out, toxic chemicals. Uh, a third layer is acid gas removal. Uh, a fourth layer is particulate. Remember when we talked about parts per thousand and parts per million, PPT or PPM, this is particulate in the atmosphere that can cause irritation or asthma or things like that. So, all these are different levels of filters that go uh, in the system 
before the flu gases come out, uh, including water vapor, those, the steam that we see uh, coming out of the chimneys, okay? Uh, there's also ash produced, which is then taken to landfill through transportation. But this is one way of getting rid of the large amount of garbage that we produce on a daily basis is just burn it in a system that traps the gases and produces uh, steam to uh, generate electricity. That amounts to about 5% of the renewable uh, energy in source in the United States. The other 5% is from solar. And this one, the, the biggest issue here, of course, is the technology, that the solar panels are not that efficient uh, yet, all right? They're not that efficient. I think the overall they're at about a 20% efficiency, which is still pretty low. And they're produced in China, right? <laughs> where, where the high level of contamination <laughs> of the atmosphere to so produce it, yeah. Irony. <laughs> yes, yes. That's another irony of this whole thing. But uh, let's look at it. Here we have these uh, photocells. Uh, the, the technical term is photovoltaic cells, all right, photovoltaic. And the beauty about this system is that, um, at least on the production of energy, is very clean. In other words, there's no combustion, there's no burning. Here, what happens is that solar energy is transferred directly into electrical energy, okay? So that is the beauty of these photovoltaic cells is done through uh, silicone crystals and these crystals are grown in chambers and then sliced and cut and so forth. But basically what happens is that the light is, uh, <clears throat> as the light hits these uh, panels, it, the sum of that light energy is transferred into electrical energy and then all those, uh, each individual photocell is wired up to channel the wires and gather that, that voltage into a substantial amount of electricity, okay? Now, this is also being used creatively in homes, in some homes, especially in areas that have little uh, cloud cover, so they have a lot of exposure to the sun. Again, in this, the mid-southwest, uh, Arizona, and Mexico, Texas. Uh, also, relatively expensive, yes. You have to see it as investment. It depends on how much you're paying for electricity in that particular area. So it can be very localized. If your electric bill is relatively high, it may pay off to do this. Sometimes you can also pump uh, energy. Sometimes these panels produce so much energy that it's not all used in the daytime, especially if people are away at work and so forth, all right? There's low energy consumption in the house. Sometimes there's a creative system whereby you can pump the electricity that you produce into the grid, let's say into FPL, for example, in kind of an energy account. And you're producing energy because FPL is always looking for energy, right? To, into industry, into commerce, and so forth. So you pump it into the grid, into high energy, into the, into the high energy demand time. And then when you use it at night, for example, in the residential, you draw from your account, from your energy account, okay? So it's similar to a bank account, but instead of money, you're using electricity. And the bank is uh, the local um, uh, electric provider for us will be FPL for the whole state, okay? Uh, of course, what happens is you're not gonna get 100%, right? FPL is gonna charge you for for managing, for storage in your account, for managing your account. So you always lose some, but I don't know, it, it really, it's a balance act. You have to see how much uh, you're paying for electricity if putting panels uh, pays off or not, all right? I can tell you also that this, uh, every few years there's a new generation of panels coming out because we have a, a solar station here, an experimental solar station next to the forest. Next time you drive into St. Thomas, look at the left-hand side on the forest, you see a little greenhouse and the roof is to solar panel, all right? That generates electricity for that little one-room house there. And it runs also the pumps, the water pumps that we use in the, in the organic garden and in the reforestation project that I have inside the forest. So it's doing its, its service there. It also runs the electricity in the Chicky Hut that is next to the solar station. So we have an experimental solar station there. Uh, a few years ago, 
Elon Musk. Elon Musk, who is this uh, innovative guy who is the owner of the uh, Tesla company for the cars, right, the electric cars. He came up with an idea of making uh, panel uh, tiles, uh, tiles that are more aesthetic. They're photovoltaic uh, tiles of different style. As you can see here, four different styles that can be used on the roof because just the, the, the classical um, uh, photocell panel is kind of unsightly. It's that blue color. It looks a little too technical, you know, too techy. And even in some, in some neighborhoods, they're not allowed because of the code. Like for example, I'm thinking here, Coral Gables, where it typically has to be barrel pile and things like that. So he came up with this idea to actually build the photovoltaic cell into a tile shape. It's a little less efficient, but it's more aesthetic and you can't really see it, uh, but it's actually is a photovoltaic roof, all right, that can be done with uh, tiles. So that's one example. The other alternative is what is called a concentrated solar power or CSP system. The CSP system is very interesting and innovative. All these panels that you see here, these are not solar panels, okay? These are not solar panels. These are essentially mirrors. These are mirrors. And that's why they are in a circular pattern because all these mirrors are reflecting, as you can see here, they are reflecting the light of the sun to this central area on top of this tower. So here's a tower at the center of this uh, circle. And the tower at the top has some kind of a metal bulb, if you will, or a metal frame that gets heated up to white hot, all right? So this is essentially like, remember the incandescent bulb that the filament actually went from red hot to white hot. When it goes to white hot, it gives away photons and that's why we can see it, all right? So <clears throat> it's the same basic principle, only in reverse. In other words, all of these uh, mirrors, which each one has a little adjustment to reflect the sunlight, or as the sunlight hits it, reflects it and concentrate it on this huge metal frame on top of this tower, all right? And so that metal frame gets quite hot because of all the rays of sun that are being accumulated, okay? <clears throat> it's similar to using a magnifying glass. Ever take a magnifying glass and burn your hand with it from the sunlight, you can focus all the rays on one spot and get a little burn on your hand because of the, the magnifying glass, right, with the sunlight. Well, that's the same basic uh, concept. What, what is done with this white hot bulb, of course, is that the heat is transferred through metal piping or metal wiring down into the ground and into this area where, again, that heat will uh, uh, um, heat up water into steam and the steam will turn the generator to generate electricity, okay? So again, it's a source of energy, of heat, to, uh, to boil water essentially, but without burning uh, fuel, without burning combustion fuel, okay? But again, it's running the steam engine. So I'm thinking out loud here as I look at the structures, and this is again huge, imagine for example, uh, these are little cars and trucks over here, all right? These are trucks, all right, on the ground here. So you can see that this is a huge uh, uh, station, really. Uh, it's just that the picture is kind of defeating when we don't have a scale. But uh, I'm thinking that this would be like the water source, the tank, and all the piping here. And then maybe the generator is, is inside this uh, building, all right? And, uh, but essentially what it does is heats up water to steam and then the steam is channeled through a generator to generate electricity. But the beauty of this is that there is no uh, burning, there's no combustion, all right? So there's no fossil fuel, I mean, there's no greenhouse gas being produced, but actually is a type of solar energy transformation. Moving forward. <clears throat> Uh, finally, geothermal, geothermal. Remember when we talked about the core of the earth and then the mantle and finally the crust of the earth, okay? 
And this is tapping in, of course, we're not going to go to the core. We're just basically going to tap into the outer layer of the mantle. And even there, very cautiously, because that is extremely hot. That is molten uh, lava, molten rock, all right, magma. And so trying to tap into some of that heat again to uh, boil water. And then that water will turn the generators um, to produce electricity. And then that water will be cooled down and re-injected into the aquifer or whatever water source is being used on the ground. So the idea here is to tap into thermals, all right? And this is a, an example of a plant, uh, of a geothermal plant where it's tapping into the, the water. You can see here, this is natural water uh, at the base here that is giving off steam. So this is very, very hot water that is being heated up naturally from uh, some contact to the mantle area where the water is uh, boiling and piped into a system where it will generate electricity. Again, the, uh, the fumes that are giving out here, this is all water vapor, essentially water vapor, because there's no burning, there's no combustion. This is geothermal. So far, it's only about 2% of the uh, energy source of the United States, 2% of the 10%, so it's still very, very tiny. I suspect that here the technology is uh, quite sophisticated considering that they're tapping in close to the mantle area and first identifying these sources, which are not all over the, the US, only in certain areas, mostly out in the, in the Pacific area. Okay. So these are the energy sources of the renewable. Now, an overall picture here before we go into uh, creativity for uh, the future, kind of summarizing, this summarizes uh, today or in this, in this decade, all right, what are the main sources of energy with their track record, with their track record. We can see that uh, traditionally it has been coal, the blue line, coal, which, um, uh, turning into this third century, into the year 2000, has taken a dip and a substantial dip, and it continues to, to go down. The trend here, the slope of the line, if we do a regression on this uh, curve, you see that it peaked around the year 2000 and the early part of the 2000s, and now is dropping quite significantly. I suspect that this is pressure from environmentalists and to try to move away from uh, combustion coal because it's a pretty dirty industry, all right? The greenhouse gases uh, are the issue here. But it's still today, today is still the major source of energy for the United States. Going down from there, we have, interestingly, what is rising is natural gas, okay? Which uh, was kind of flat until the 1990s or maybe the second half of the 80s when these deposits of natural gas were being discovered and uh, tapped into, and then fracking comes into play in the 1990s. And you can see that this general trend here, the slope of this line, the yellow line, is still on the rise. And we can predict uh, <coughs> anything else being equal that this will continue to be on the rise simply because of the vast resources of natural gas that have been found in the United States and uh, also with uh, perfecting the fracking techniques and so forth, they still get a lot of bang for the buck of natural gas, okay? But the downside of it is that it has to be combusted, it has to be burned to obtain the energy and therefore uh, greenhouse production, which can be minimized again with filters. Third source is nuclear which you can see has kind of stabilized uh, since the 90s. It was on the rise ever since the late 60s through for a couple of decades, steady rise. This is, it's kind of steady like that because this is long term. I mean, it's a slow slope, right? Very slow uh, log phase here really because uh, they take a long time to build, to design first and then to implement and so forth. 
but now it has kind of tapered off and it has remained kind of stable uh, under one uh, gigaton of production, uh, a trillion, trillion kilowatts of uh, production of energy in the United States. Okay. So this is one that is in the background there again because of the high risk of the uh, nuclear um, energy involved in it. Now, of the renewables, here we have, uh, this has been creeping up slowly with its uh, waxing and waning until today. That seems to be on a rise. What is driving this a lot is the technology and this move for alternative energy, but this is the sum total of uh, renewable energy in the US, which is, seems to be, is still pretty small, uh, but it looks promising in that it's, at least it has an uptick over here. It's still too early to see the general trend in, in this third millennium is a positive trend, right? There will be a positive slope on this line, but it's anybody's guess. Uh, hopefully this will continue to trend up with creativity and, and uh, technology ingenuity put to uh, good use. Finally, what is interesting is look at petroleum use, which is very, I wasn't expecting this one totally took me by surprise because the lower curve here is petroleum um, taking a rise since the 60s and uh, plateauing or uh, maxim, maximizing there in the mid 70s and then starting to drop ever since the 80s, fairly low, and is very, very low today, which was very surprising to me that truly uh, for, uh, for electricity anyway, is such a low amount mm, of um, petroleum is using, being used to produce electricity. Yes, so this whole graph is based on electricity. Yes, exactly. This is kilowatt production uh, yes. per hour in the United States. Okay, so this is, the electrical production, the production of electricity, okay? And that's why, but now thinking again, of course, what happens is that this is just electricity. In other words, this is most of the petroleum today in the United States is being used for transportation, for combustion, all right? Or for fuel, not for electricity. And so this uh, already only represents that 15%, if you will, or uh, other uses of the petroleum that is not um, fuel for transportation. Okay, okay uh, moving forward now, a little bit into the, the present and the future, some creative ideas. Uh, first, to harness just the, uh, the tide and the wave motion. This, these are two creative ideas that are implemented now, this in the west coast of uh, the United States somewhere, uh, these two floating uh, gadgets that move up and down with the, with the uh, tide, excuse me, and remember the tide in the Pacific is more significant. First, there are two tides as opposed to one here. And secondly, uh, there's a bigger tide difference in the Pacific coast than in the uh, Atlantic simply because uh, the Pacific is much larger by volume. So whenever these arms move up and down, underneath what is not seen here below ground is some kind of a, a friction uh, generator of electricity, which is similar to the generator rotating fully around. These, uh, these two moving arms up and down generate essentially uh, something analogous to a turbine rotating around is producing uh, friction and from that friction static electricity then can be converted into uh, current, alternate, alternate current, all right? So these are essentially generating electricity by moving these arms up and down. And it's passive in the sense that once the structure is built, then uh, the tide does the rest. Also for this long uh, gadget here, this thing, also moves with the current. You can see a wave here uh, uh, moving uh, through this long sausage-like structure. The idea is that as that sausage moves 
one segment from the other. Again, that movement will cause a friction that will generate electricity. Okay, so somehow this, uh, this worm, artificial worm uh, on the surface of the uh, ocean is generating electricity passively by the movement of the articulation of the different segments of the worm. Okay, and then that is uh, on the ground where the wire mm, that electricity can be pumped to, uh, to the shore nearby somewhere. Uh, electric cars are an increasing number. Uh, a few decades ago, there were only a couple of models, experimental models of electric cars. Uh, in fact, I can tell you uh, in 1964, okay, in 1964, uh, we were living in, in uh, New York City and um, the World Fair was going on in New York City at that time. Mm -hmm. Let me just go there for a moment because I found this uh, very exciting. Uh, my brother and I were little kids and it was just my parents, my brother and I were living in New York City at that time. And we were maybe 11 and 12 years old, something like that, maybe 12, 13. Uh, let me see. Um, uh, New York World Fair. Uh, 1964. Yeah. And we went, our parents took us there, and of course, we were just thrilled and delighted uh, to visit all that stuff. Uh, you know, uh, there it is, uh, the, um, they had this that's the New York World Fair going on in 1964. And uh, this globe was built for the occasion. And then there is a, a small representation of this in um, what is that Madison Square Garden in New York City that is holding, it had Hercules holding the globe, all right, on his shoulders. Same one is it really? No, Maybe no, I don't know. So <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a newer one. Yeah. But uh, this was uh, the World Fair going on back then, and we were so thrilled. I remember as little kids going here, and what we saw uh, some of the, the futuristic machines that were being built. Okay, one of the futuristic machines was uh, the dishwasher. <laughs> So housewives were delighted <laughs> with the dishwasher. Okay, I don't know if it has actually synthesized their lives or not 50 years later, but here it is. Okay, uh, one of the creative ideas for the, uh, the car industry was electric cars. Okay, and I remember seeing electric cars, experimental electric cars at the New York World Fair in 1964. Okay, so those electric cars somehow disappeared from the market. They were never actually put into the market, I suspect because of the oil industry and OPEC and the big, uh, um, the big impact of petroleum uh, in the oil industry, uh, in the, in the uh, gasoline motor, the piston motor. So they were sequestered and never really produced until the uh, maybe the 1980s, uh, when the uh, electric cars, let me see, um, uh, electric uh, car history, just briefly. I suspect it was in the 80s, maybe 90s. Uh, oh, look at that, 1937, 1837 was the very first one. <laughs> Not too efficient, I'm sure, but when they really became commercial. Uh, Let's just take a look here for a moment because I'm curious. And these, uh, the EV, here's EV1, let's see, uh, in the 1990s. Yeah, the nickel hydride uh, batteries had to become available. In, um, uh, I suspect it was you know, in the 1990s. Call, uh, Ford, GM built one called the Volt. Yeah, it's but now they, available. But not but they're not making them anymore. I think they no, it's, no, it's back, it's back. And so the, the, the problem of the Bolt is that there's Bolt with a cap, with a B as in uh, brown, and there's Bolt with a V as in voltage, okay? And they go back and forth with the name. So 
uh, one is a hybrid, which has electric and gasoline motor, yes. like yeah. a backup, and the other one is fully electric. I looked at it, I looked at it last year precisely because I was uh, going to uh, change my car. Uh, it turns out I have an electric car. Uh, and they, I think they started in production in the 90s uh, and they have gone into now, well, yeah, of course, this is in Tesla, which is kind of the Cadillac of the industry. But uh, what I had was a little Mitsubishi Niev. I, Niev, let's see. Um, this was uh, four years ago. I got one of these. And uh, it was uh, a lease, all right? And the Miev had about 65 miles on the range, on the full charge, 65 miles. Uh, so I leased it for three years because I knew that the technology was ramping up. And then by the end of the three-year lease, all right, which was, uh, uh, so I got this in uh, 14, 14, 15, 16, yeah. In 17, last year, the lease was up. So I returned it. I had uh, $9,000 uh, to pay on it if I was going to purchase. Well, it turns $9,000. So I went on the market and I started looking around and I found the, uh, what I have now, what's it called? The Leaf, uh, Nissan Leaf. All right. And it turns out that I found the Leaf, which um, is fully electric. And that's uh, the one outside here. Yeah, yeah, that's the one here. Okay, that's the one I have. And so this one, Nissan Leaf, is fully electric and it has 95 miles on the range, so 30% more than I had on the last one, almost, almost, almost 100 miles on the range, which is you have to keep in mind that uh, electric cars for now, they're urban cars. In other words, they're, they just run around for the city. You know, it's like the phone, you use it during the day. You plug it in overnight, recharges overnight, and then you keep going again the next day. And so you keep it going that way, all right? But this one now, it has 95 miles, almost, almost 100 miles on the range, better, 30% more than what I had on the last one. And um, this one is from um, 2015, so it's three years old. Three years old, and it was $8,000 total, <laughs> okay? So I bought it for $8,000 off, oh, and it was in such good quality that um, uh, they gave me, they're called, uh, what are they called? They're called, um, they have a name, certified, certified. This is all new to me, all right? But uh, the car is certified, it's a, it's a used car, but it's certified, meaning that it's such in good, pristine condition that the company will give you the factory warranty on it for $1,000. So for, for $9,000, I bought the warranty on it. In other words, I bought the car and the warranty all for $9,000 and it's 100,000 miles on the warranty or 10 years. So it's like brand new, okay? Why? Because they depreciate a lot. In other words, this one that has almost 100 mile range on it, it's outdated because the new model Leaf, the, the 2018 model Leaf has 200 miles range on it or 220, that's, the, the current range for the, for the electric cars is between 200, 250 miles, all right, on a charge, 250 miles. The long and the short about all this, what I can say is that for the past four years, all right, for the past four years, I have not been to a gas station <laughs> to fill up. I have not been to change oil, nothing. There's zero maintenance on it, zero, because it's just an electric motor, a huge battery underneath, you know, which makes it uh, bottom heavy and very stable. And for the rest, just plug it in overnight, recharge, and use it during so the day. How much does it charge? How much does it cost to recharge? It's estimated about between $250, $300 per year, all right, of electricity. So you're getting year. Recharging every night, recharging always, recharging the battery every day. So, but it depends on, like for instance, if you charge overnight, that's the cheapest rate, you know. So again, it depends on the rate of FPL now, I think it's about 10 or 11 cents per, per kilowatt hour or something like that. So depending on the time of day that you charge, but at night is, is the cheapest charge, okay? It's the cheapest uh, rate. And uh, so it's estimated to between $250, $300 of electricity per year. So you put up on that market, you say, give me up. 
Yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. And, but think of low maintenance, and then it has other stuff. So it's totally clean, there's no noise. You turn it on, and there's no noise. You know, because like when you turn on the light switch, you don't hear anything, right? <laughs> and uh, very, very clean, uh, and silent, mm, cool, because there's no heat coming out of, there's no combustion, okay? The things that it doesn't have that cannot break down, it's very simple technology. Doesn't have a radiator, doesn't have pistons, of course. There's no starter motor. Uh, there's no oil, no oil change, no gasoline tank, no fuel pump, no transmission. It's direct drive. You just press the accelerator and it feeds the battery, feeds the, the electrical motor. So, no transmission. None of these things can break because they don't exist. Even the brakes, they have what is known as regenerative brake. In other words, uh, once I take off, Say I'm, I'm accelerating, all right? And then I see a, a red light far away. I take my foot off the accelerator. Automatically, the electric motor turns into a generator, turns to an, to an electric generator, and it's recharging the battery. Of course, you don't recharge everything because there's friction. Friction is lost, all right? Uh, but it recharges some. But the biggest saving on the, um, what is called regenerative braking, is that the car passively, Without touching the brake pedal, without touching the brake, the car is slowing down passively because of the generator motor, all right? So it's slowing down slowly, you know, without touching the brakes. So I'm saving on the brakes. By the time I get to brake, I'm almost in front of the light, I'm 10 feet away from the light, and I just uh, use the brake slightly to stop the car, all right? That's if the light hasn't turned green. But I use very, very little of the pads, of the brake pads. Speed is up in front. Yeah, top speed. Off the record, I, I, I can go, I've gone to 85 miles an hour on this, and it can go more. It can go 90, okay? But of course, it also rewards safe driving because the higher speed, the more electricity you use. So yeah. if you use, this is ideal, for example, bumper to bumper traffic and slow traffic. It's a perfect grocery car. It is the perfect, yes, it's the runaround. To do the runaround things during the day, like for now, like a second car, you know, if you need to travel a lot, you have a main car, or if you have a family and you need to get out and so forth. Uh, but for the city, in my mind, it's ideal. And I can tell you, four years, I haven't been to a gas station, <laughs> all right? And, uh, and zero maintenance on it. It's just, to me, truly, it's the future. And that's why we see, what do we see in the market, in the market economy, we see more and more different models of electric cars coming up. Yes. They're European, European, uh, Japanese, and now American also. Well, BMW is coming up with one next year. They have, no, they have it. BMW has yeah. one already. Yeah, but well, it's sold here next year. No, no, here already, already. Here, Louis, right? you're, yeah, you have to get a bit and I'll, I'll tell you electric cars. Uh, uh, that are available, the models, it's an increasing number of models that are available today, it's amazing. There are at least a dozen, it doesn't. The, okay, so new, new, all right, the 2018 models, the range is between 25 to 35,000, that's the range. The so it's a mid range. Yeah, that's the range right there. That leaf, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, the little Miev, okay, when I bought it, the, the buying ticket was 25,000, was in the low end. I leased it, of course. I leased it for $200 a month, okay? And the interest, because they were promoting it, the interest was 0.9 interest on the, on the lease. So, I mean, it was a sweet deal. By the time I turned it in, it was obsolete, so I upgraded, okay? Uh, but see, this is the BMW, for example. It's already out in the market, all right? Uh, yeah, some are very sophisticated and fancy. This is the Tesla, for example. Uh, this is one of those uh, smart things, which is fully electric, a Fiat. Here is uh, Chevy, whatever that is. Uh, well, if they lower those things to under 20,000. Yeah. If yep. they lower it under 20,000, they're not the, fuel, uh, the, the, the gas cars right off the market. Right. That's what I'm saying. You know, it's, the, the thing now is the range, okay? But it's an increasing number of these cars coming on the market, and you know what's driving it is a market economy. Okay. So it's, you can buy a lead for under ten thousand dollars one. Used, yes. Used, yes. But you know what the trick is? Is to find them. 
because they get sucked up as soon as they go on the market, people pick them up, all right? And so it's, uh, it's worthwhile. I mean, in my mind, this is the way to go. And it's very clean, very low maintenance. It's just amazing. Uh, see, they're all here. Okay, so you can do your research. There, there are now, I can tell you, they're domestic, they're European, and they're Japanese, Korean. They're all out there because every company is feeling the, if they don't produce one, then they get left behind, all right? Even companies that are producing uh, gasoline cars, and it's still their main product is the gasoline, they'll have one line, which will be an electric car. Or, of course, we also have to look at the hybrids. Now, the hybrids, there are many different kinds of hybrids. Hybrids means that you have an electric motor and you have a gasoline motor. Either they work in combination back and forth, or it could be, they'll say it's fully electric, but they'll have a generator that is gasoline driven, all right, which is a smaller motor that is used as a generator just to generate electricity. To me, the decision between fully electric with no gasoline motor or hybrid, with the hybrids, you get two or 300 miles range on a, a per gallon, all right? Uh, but to me, it was a question of principle. In other words, with a hybrid, one way or another, no matter what different type of hybrid you have, one way or another, you end up with two motors. So I'm thinking mechanically, you have more parts. You have more moving parts. Whereas with electric and no backup, no gasoline backup, you only have the one electric motor and system to deal with, all right? Uh, so that's why, to me, it was a question of principle. Do I want really to end up with two motors or just one single motor and make the transition to fully electric? And that's what I did four years ago. To this day, I'm extremely happy with it. Of course, it's a city car, all right? And it's all about the range. But you can see that the range continues to increase with technology and the photo cells uh, that are being uh, uh, on the, the, um, the, the battery cell batteries uh, are getting more and more efficient. So anyway, that's uh, my little spiel on the uh, electric cars, which I uh, highly encourage you to look at, uh, look into, all right? Mm, then, for example, uh, we've seen that on electricity also, the transition here, essentially three levels of transition, uh, going back to the incandescent bulb, what is known as the incandescent, Remember the incandescent bulb has a little metal wire in between and that wire gets first in, in one instant gets red hot and but then it goes to white hot and it's the white hot that gives away photons all right and so produces the electricity but in order to do that it gets extremely hot remember how with, with these incandescent bulbs you could not change them right away <laughs> you had to wait for them to cool down or use a handkerchief or whatever uh, so that was the, the first layer, if you will, of the bulb. Then we went from that to the neon bulb or the fluorescent bulb. The fluorescent bulb works on a totally different principle, which is putting gas, a neon gas, inside this little tube, a glass tube, and then that gas is energized into fluorescence so that it will give off, again, photons uh, by being uh, excited to a higher level of energy, the, the gas itself, the neon gas inside, and that's what produces the fluorescence or the light, okay? So it's a different principle uh, and more efficient. As you can see, the wattage for the amount of light uh, is, uh, is uh, <clears throat> less and less, and they become more efficient. They also cost uh, more. They tend to last longer and so forth. Mm. Then the next level, the, the current level of uh, lighting is with uh, LED, which is liquid, it's a um, light emitting diode. That's what LED means, uh, excuse me. Uh, it's a light emitting diode. So a diode essentially is a chemical that when it receives electricity, gives off photons, but it's by a different uh, chemical process than either exciting a gas or uh, heating up a filament, a metal filament to, to, to becoming quite hot, okay? It's a different uh, chemical process. These diodes give off uh, photons when they receive electric electricity, and that's the latest technology there. 
they cost more, but they're much more efficient. They last an average of 20 years or so. Uh, so this is the way to go today, much more efficient, very minimal uh, amount of electricity used for, um, for uh, producing uh, uh, light, okay? So at home, if you still have incandescent bulbs, turn them off, wait until they cool down and get rid of them and go directly to the LED, all right? If you've got fluorescent, also changing for LED. They're a little more expensive, but you save tremendously when you look at the energy cost saving. Uh, so it's an investment because it will last you 20 times more than the uh, incandescent bulb or 10 times more or two times more than the fluorescent LEDs. Okay? Uh, some other creativity here, for example, in this train, Look at this uh, train, it could be either a uh, bullet train or it could be a uh, subway type, but look at underneath on the rail. You see the distance here? It's actually floating. It's floating on a magnet, a magneto. So the creativity here is that the electricity inside the train will create a magnetic field and then the rail will create the same type of uh, field, right? So it will be positive and positive, for example, which will repel each other. And that field is strong enough to actually float that train. And then uh, there has to be, um, actually, I think it's, it's a, it's a um, the field changes positive, negative, so it actually attracts the, the train forward at the same time, all right? It's a, it's a change, there's like a pulse going through the rail and the, the magnets on the, on the, um, on the train, uh, receive that pulse as a wave and actually uh, drags or, or propels the uh, train forward. But the exciting thing about this is that as it floats, there's no friction. And therefore all the heat and the energy that would be lost as friction, which is a major uh, component uh, of the drag is eliminated. So that's much more efficient, okay? And they can go at a faster uh, speed and so forth. So this is some stuff looking into the future. A couple of other creativity here from actual biofuel. In other words, generating electricity from plants. This is a discovery that has been made mm, that uh, plants produce in a collaborative system with the bacteria that live in the soil and the feed from, from the excess glucose of the plants, all right? This is a university, Tübingen University in the Netherlands that is doing research on the, the bacteria that are recycling the excess glucose produced by plants that is pumped into the root system. And as the bacteria metabolize that glucose, they produce electricity. That electricity is a small amount, but it can be harnessed, all right? It's a small amount, but a small surface. When we increase that to a large surface, it can become significant. So this is still at the research level. Let me show you this little video. A couple of minutes uh, to explain the production of electricity by combination between plant uh, root system and the actual, and the bacteria. Let me see how we, uh, just a moment, I always have an issue with the sound system here. Okay, let me see how to figure it out. This one is on. Uh, it has to go. Let's see if one of these plugs is this. Let's see if this plug is. Because I always have this issue. I still can't hear it. This other one is the video. Hmm. Okay, um, I don't 
for the city. I just see what that no, still does a bit. Mm. I always have difficulty with this and I forget to check beforehand. Oh. Okay, so this is on. And this one is also on. Maybe this one. This one on. Which one? Maybe here. This is one of the sound systems of the room. One more time. Room. I know it's a switch somewhere. There. Let's see. Let's see. I know you are computer savvy that way, huh? I think John figured it out one time. And systems. Uh, and the control sound. That's the same one. Red back sounds. You don't know anything about this? <laughs> you don't. How can you know what you're doing? <laughs> can you tell that I know what I'm doing? <laughs> I'm glad you know what I'm not doing. <laughs> I'm glad I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Focus, uh, what is this button? Location. Okay. Mm -hmm. I take this one off. Yeah, that's uh, Unmute your speaker. Just to get a change, three PA. Maybe the sound still. Maybe I need to mute. Probably. We are here. Let me see if I need to mute this one. Mm 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not doing that. I, 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 it's okay. called plant okay. microbial fuel Amazing. cell and can generate electricity from the natural interrupt. Okay, so it says coming out from the computer, but I think you can hear it. All right, see? Action between plant the lesson to be learned is that if you push enough buttons, <laughs> you either make it work or you break it all together, right? In this case, the good Lord was uh, good and uh, merciful and allowed me to do it. So here we go. It's a two minute uh, video. Mm -hmm. Plants like these could soon provide our electricity. In a small way, they already are in research laboratories and greenhouses at Project Plant E, a university and commercially sponsored research group at Wageningen University in the Netherlands. It's called the plant microbial fuel cell and can generate electricity from the natural interaction between plant roots and soil bacteria. It works by taking advantage of the up to 70% of organic material produced via photosynthesis that can't be used by the plant and is excreted through the roots. As naturally occurring bacteria around the roots break down this organic residue, electrons are released as a waste product. An electrode absorbs them and generates electricity. Solar panels are making more energy per square meter, but we expect to reduce the costs of our system technology in the future. And our system can be used for different applications. Plant and microbial fuel cells can be used on various scales. An experimental 15 square meter model can produce enough electricity to power a computer notebook. Our system can be used for different applications. Our technology is making electricity, but also could be used as roof insulation or as a water collector. On a bigger scale, it's possible to produce rice and electricity at the same time and in that way to combine food and energy production. This is a rooftop. This is the rooftop of the university. They're growing rice up there. The first prototype of a green electricity roof was installed on one building at Wageningen University, and researchers are keeping a close eye on what's growing there. Okay. Wageningen University is in the Netherlands. So they're very up and up on uh, these. Uh, yes. That would be perfect mm -hmm. because they have so much. They have so oh, much well. farmland here. Right. They exactly. Um, limited farmland, mm -hmm. so to speak. Yes. Uh, yes. And all the uh, all the uh, soil that they've recovered from the. Uh, <clears throat> oh, from the uh, from the ocean. But anyway, so that's a creative idea of uh, harvesting electricity from plants, right? Uh, by that uh, process of the bacteria, which is happening. It's a small amount, but it's happening all over the, the earth right now as, plant, as uh, bacteria are metabolizing the, uh, the excess uh, glucose from plants. This one is a different technology which is growing algae and then using that algae to produce biofuel. In other words, bulk mass biofuel, okay? And this is here in the US, encouraging to see industry uh, pairing up with the other biofuel uh, industry, which is uh, corn. In Iowa, where corn is almost a religion, a new faith may be taking root. This is algae growing out of bushes. It's just like a cornfield. We run the harvester. This is a harvester. It reminds us of a combine pulling off the algae. Algae? Isn't that something we usually try to get rid of? You can actually crack the code on actually growing and harvesting algae and getting this biomass. The application for this biomass is really incredible. You can use it to feed animals. You can use it to feed people. You can take its very high value in protein. You could use it to fuel your car and get the oil out of that. So I have it contained. Yeah. Why so much interest is in it because it has such a wide application, so many different sources. In addition to its biofuel possibilities, algae is already being used in all kinds of ways you might not be aware of. Food products, baby formula, or nutritional supplements like spirulina. 
algae contains the all-important nutrient, omega-3 fatty acids. It's all about omega-3s, and the world is short of omega-3s. They're long omega-6s and omega-7s, but they're short omega-3s. And algae may have the best ability to solve the shortage of omega-3s in the world at the highest quantity. Quantity. That's what they're trying to tackle here in Shenandoah, Iowa. In an unusual pairing, a traditional corn ethanol plant is supporting algae production, a next-generation biofuel. It turns out corn has what algae needs. A third of the kernel of starch being converted into fuel, a third of the kernel is fiber being converted into animal feed, and there's a third left. And all that is being today is being converted into CO2 in the atmosphere. So we could actually take that other third of the kernel that we're basically emitting into the atmosphere, capture it, and create a whole other product around how we convert CO2, warm water, waste heat, and sunlight into algae. CO2, wastewater, and heat, all byproducts of producing corn ethanol, exactly what algae needs. This joint project called Bioprocess Algae is the result of an unlikely partnership. This whole process has been serendipitous. Todd Becker, CEO of Green Plains Renewable Energy, a major producer of <coughs> corn ethanol, and Tim Burns, CEO of Bioprocess H2O, a water treatment company whose technology has been used to get algae out of water. How to keep algae out of wastewater systems. We have a lot of knowledge, and that knowledge gave us the opportunity to bring it into how we can grow algae, and we knew that with our system. The heart of it is attached growth. We have a system in which we provide attached a lot of growth. surface area. Attached growth. For the algae, algae needs somewhere to attach. A condominium for the algae to reside on. And that condominium provides a lot of surface area, so we have a big mass transfer device. Think of it that way. So on a typical open pond system, which algae is traditionally grown on, we would be about 40 times the surface area of the system. So it gives us a lot of opportunity to be more cost effective. Let's say an acre of land. An acre of land that produces corn today in the United States produces seven tons per acre. Our goal in these reactors is to get 15 to 40 tons per acre of product. And instead of a once a year harvest, algae is harvested several times a week. The idea of getting gas and oil from algae is really not new. In fact, it's millions of years old. All our oil today is ancient algae deposits, compaction of hundreds of millions of years of riverbeds and compaction of algae ownership. What we're trying to do is accelerate with the process and to what Mother Nature has done so effectively and start to industrialize it and produce by our process. The stumbling block is cost. But recent breakthroughs promise to reduce that cost. At the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, researchers have developed a technology that uses extreme pressure and high temperatures to accomplish in minutes what nature has done over millions of years, convert algae into oil. Still, oil. to be cost-effective, algae needs to be grown in high volume. And co-locating algae production with a corn ethanol plant might point the way. You basically can use free inputs to sunlight, wastewater, warm water, heat, and CO2, and there's a lot of all of that available. And so if you actually combine all that, you actually take something that is really free and you're gonna create something with a lot of value. And in the process, they just might be teaching the rest of the world a new way to look at that greenhouse gas, CO2, instead of a pollutant, it could become a product. If you think about the ability to utilize greenhouse gases and CO2, algae, in my opinion, is the only profitable use of CO2 currently on the market. So if you're able to profitably use that CO2 portion, that's going to give you opportunity to mitigate the rest of the CO2 emission. Reducing CO2 emissions while growing a renewable and sustainable fuel source that could mean less expensive gas. That is the promise of algae. It's a combine. It may be a while before algae dethrones corn in this part of the world, but as this remarkable experiment is demonstrating, there's no reason they can't get along. Exciting, huh? Hey, Dad, so are you really? So, creativity, <laughs> amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, these are two examples of natural uh, products that are being used 
uh, experimented and hopefully will lead to some uh, <clears throat> good, uh, good use. A couple of other things, uh, for example, in residential, whether a house is up north or down here in the tropics, it can be designed in such a way as to uh, maximize its energy conservation mm -hmm, and minimize its energy use. For example, if it's up north, the house will be oriented in a way that there will be passive solar heating, right? By the sun, by the exposure of the sun, and then uh, generating a clear story glass frame uh, facing the sun so that the sunlight is trapped in there and converted into heat when it hits the surface inside the house and uh, heating up passively, heating up the, the house inside passively. Uh, <clears throat> also, if it's here in the tropics or in the subtropical or temperate uh, region, the house can be designed in the opposite direction whereby there's a flow um, of air, the, the window, uh, the clear story is put on the opposite side instead of facing the sun, facing away from the sun, so it's always in the shade. And also that it would uh, open so that it will create a breezeway. We know that heat rises. Have you ever noticed if you have a, a two-story house or um, upstairs is warmer than downstairs, right, typically? All right, <clears throat> that's because of two things. First of all, because of the heat that is generated through the roof when the, when the sun hits the roof, part of that heat uh, transfers into the house. <clears throat> but also the heat that naturally rises from the bottom floor up. So by putting a clear story openings on the shady side of the house, that will create a breezeway so that the air can vent through, all right, and fresh air will coming in and displacing that warm air on the second story. Also, uh, trees that are deciduous trees, deciduous means that they will shed their leaves in the winter, all right, the winter will be cooler, so it allows the sun to come through the branches, the bare branches, and warm up the house passively, but in the summer, the tree will be full of leaves and affect uh, form shade for the house and uh, prevent the sun from hitting directly on the house uh, during certain hours of the day. All right, so houses can be uh, designed uh, to be more energy efficient. This house even has a little cistern here collecting all the rainwater. We have significant amount of rain here in South Florida. All that could be channeled through gutters into a cistern that can be used and that rainwater can be used for water in the garden instead of having to use the, the tap water, which uh, people have to pay for, for water, right? Um, another one is mm, a tankless water heater, which is called commercially a Titan. I don't know if any of you heard of these uh, Titans, but what this does is uh, it heats up the water as it's going through the pipe. So it doesn't have a water heater. When you think of the water heater, this water is heated up and it's maintained hot there all day long without being used. And so there is loss, this transfer of heat out through the walls passively and it's constantly being heated, but it's not being used all the time. And so it's not that efficient compared to these um, uh, uh, titans that heat up the water as the water goes through. Of course, you can always regulate the temperature of the water, uh, but they're very, very efficient. It takes um, a dedicated line though. It takes an electrical dedicated line from the box, from the separate box. And so that's one of the downsides. It's a little bit of electric investment to set up this uh, Titan system in a home. But uh, in the long run, you save, um, you know, I think the, in a home, in a typical home, the highest uh, item on the electrical bill is going to be the air conditioner, all right? And then the second highest is going to be the water heater. The second will be the water heater. And so this Titan will reduce your electrical bill significantly, but it takes an initial investment to set up the system. Everything else. Exactly, everything else. It's an initial investment and then you have to 
uh, weigh it out, you know, how many years you're gonna be staying in that house and how long will it amort uh, amortize. Mm -hmm. But these are creative things that are coming out. Uh, uh, the more modern homes will have these patterns already installed in them. Okay, going a little further into uh, air transportation, for example, I don't know if you heard of the solar impulse. The original solar impulse was a simpler design, uh, but did not have uh, the capacity of this one. This is solar impulse two, is the name <coughs> of this plane. And as you can see, the wings and the tail wing here also is made up of uh, solar panels, all right? And so this is, uh, this is the first plane to fly around the earth several stops, all right? It took about uh, 16 months or so. It didn't take the whole, it, it was not a single flight, but it eventually went around the whole world uh, without any fuel, just on solar panels, okay? Just on solar panels. And it's self-sufficient. It takes off and lands also on its own power, all right? So it has, this is kind of equivalent to electric car in the sense that it has no fuel, no um, piston motor. These are uh, uh, electric motor, I think it has four electric motors and a cabin of um, two, I think it's two uh, pilots, all right? But uh, the, for the first time in 2016, this um, plane managed to go around the world uh, in several stops, I think it did, uh, uh, three stops or something like that, three or four stops. Um, it's Swiss, yes, it was a Swiss uh, entrepreneur. I think this is the Golden Gate, uh, the Golden Gate uh, Bridge going over, uh, uh, right? This uh, Orange Tower, San Francisco, yeah, uh, the Pacific Coast. That was the major, the biggest one was, the biggest um, track was from Hawaii, I think, to, to California was the longest uh, track, all right? And so I finally did that and completed the, the flight around the world. And then finally, the uh, International Space Station, otherwise known as ISS, right? The ISS is, uh, I think I mentioned it already, the largest artifact that uh, humanity has ever built. It was uh, started in the uh, 1998, and it's still under construction. They're continuously adding modules to it, but it will become obsolete, I think, in 2025 or something like that, uh, because the technology has uh, advanced so much that maintaining this thing, the maintenance of this uh, station is becoming uh, too high, you know, because the technology has been superseded already. But what I wanted to point out, and this is a whole modular lab where um, astronauts have lived there for years, a year at a time sometimes, and they are running all kinds of experiments in zero gravity, and, but it's all fueled by uh, solar panels, okay? So this whole station, the largest artifact uh, ever built by humanity, which is actually in, 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 no sp in space, all right, in floating around in, in inner orbit, is all fueled by uh, solar panels. Of course, the big advantage there is that you don't have the atmosphere. Look how thin the atmosphere looks from here from space. Uh, and that's the 10 kilometers, <laughs> right, of the atmosphere that we talked about earlier. <clears throat> the big advantage uh, for solar panels here is that you don't have all that filtering of uh, light that occurs through the, through the atmosphere for us, okay, so they get uh, high intensity uh, light to these uh, panels. <coughs> All right, finally, I wanna conclude with um, just last week, you've heard me say this before, not a week goes by, <laughs> all right, without some bioethical issue around the world, some new issue around the world. Here we have Pope Francis, uh, a week ago today, precisely last Saturday, he gave an address to um, an international uh, group, a conference of uh, about 40 uh, CEOs and executives of oil and gas companies that he invited to the Vatican for a two-day conference and a two-day uh, collaboration between them to encourage them 
to make the transition from fossil fuels into alternative fuels, all right? Alternative energy. And there were some very big uh, players that participated. They were CEOs and high executives from Exxon, from any, excuse me, any is the Italian um, gasoline uh, producer uh, company, uh, British Petroleum, Shell, Dutch Shell was there, Equinor from Norway, and Pemex, Pemex is from Mexico, Petroleos Mexicanos, all right? So among others that participated, there was a, a close meeting for these uh, CEOs and executives, you see them here in the background, all sitting, uh, listening to the people address. Mm, and I will send you this address, I, I have it online, it's translated into it's, uh, in English. Just one little quotation here toward the end of his address to these uh, high executives, he says to them, <clears throat> I invite you to be the core of a group of leaders who envision the global energy transition in a way that will take into account all the peoples of the earth, all right, inclusiveness because of this natural right to energy for living, uh, as well as future generations. This is what is called as uh, intergenerational justice. In other words, we inherited a world with a particular biodiversity what are we passing on to the next generation? You know, there's a responsibility there. So intergenerational uh, justice and fairness, future generations, and also the ecosystem. In other words, to try to preserve biodiversity as much as possible, okay? So that responsibility of the people living today, the people living tomorrow, and the ecosystem that surrounds us. So we definitely have a, a green pope, right? And that's precisely why he's taken the name of Francis. He's, uh, he's inspired by uh, St. Francis of Assisi, love for nature, including human nature. And he's acting on that uh, pretty uh, precisely, pretty um, incisively, all right? So I find it encouraging that these, uh, these high executives, all who are big into the oil and gas uh, business, accepted the invitation of the Holy Father to stay at the Vatican for two days and put their minds together to see how they can uh, help be uh, instrumental in that transition uh, from uh, fossil fuels to renewables. All right, so we see that uh, human creativity knows no bounds and limits. Let's uh, put it to good use, okay? Um, I'll leave you with that. Hopefully this uh, inspire folks to look at uh, alternative energy consumption. And the little thing, if I can pick up from uh, last uh, lectures, uh, a little thing is uh, reduce, reuse, and recycle, right? We can live simpler lives, trying to turn things off uh, when we're not using them and so forth, and, and try to live uh, uh, consonant with the environment, try to and minimize our footprint as much as possible. Okay, questions, comments, no? Okay, I'll leave you with this then. I'm going to uh, turn it off now. Don't forget, please, your evaluations. Don't forget uh, your summaries. And I'll send you the papal statement, which is about three or four pages. Uh, please read it. Read the statement on your own. You don't have to summarize the whole statement for me, but do read it and be informed of what's happening in our church at the highest possible level of our church, okay? Uh, see how we can uh, be part of this uh, Catholic ecological movement uh, that our Holy Father is uh, pushing forward. All right, thanks again, and I'll see you next Saturday for the last time in this course. I'm going to stop the recording now. Bye, everyone. <laughs>